I yet remember my first experience of the Canadian countryside. My nurse, Lisa Manika, took me on a visit to her village home. I was very young then, not more than five or six. I believe the love of my country and its real people sang on that memorable day. At the dawn of this century, the life that George Keith was born into was so very, very different that it almost seems another world. The elite of Edwardian Ceylon lived a life stuffily imitative of their English rulers. The simple Sinhala and Tamil people were merely a backdrop to their Western lifestyle. Every endeavor was made to mold him into a model of an English public schoolboy who grew up to be a civil servant or judge, a pillar of the colonial establishment. But Keith fitted no mold. Even as a young child, he was a compulsive artist. In school, books interested him, but not formal study. It was through his reading that Keith found his way to the art and traditions of his motherland. The writings of Rabindranath Tagore profoundly impressed him, and they inspired him to discover for himself the rich Singhala culture that surrounded the rarefied enclave into which he was born. He roamed the Candian countryside and discovered the beauty of its Hindu and Buddhist temples, the people, their music, their rituals, and the rich religious texture of their humble lives. under the dignified and vivid medieval murals of the cave temple at Pegaldorua. The philosophy of Buddhism, the rituals of its temples and the literature of the Sinhalese took over his life almost completely. He spent all his time at the Malvatta Vihari, painting everything that fascinated him. The temple, the monks, the worshippers. His guru and great friend was the Bhikkhu Pinnavela Dhirananda, who opened Keats' eyes to the richness of Sinhala literature and poetry. Together they produced a pioneering book, Poetry from the Sinhalese, introducing Sinhalese poetry to those readers who still exercise the colonial habit of comparison with European poetry. During this period, almost everything that Keats painted or wrote centered on his Buddhist thinking. When he saw Sigiriya's incomparable frescoes, the highest achievement of Sinhalese art, they made as lasting an impact on his artistic vision as they did on the poets of old. Seeing you sway on the mountain, my heart leapt with delight. Who is not happy when he sees those rosy palms, rounded shoulders, gold necklaces, copper-hued lips and long, Long eyes, sweet girl, standing on the mountain. Your teeth are as jewels lighting the lotus of your eyes. Talk to me gently of your heart. Keith now began to devote his whole life to painting. Supported and encouraged by his close friend, the incomparable Lionel Went, photographer of genius, remarkable pianist, brilliant talker, perceptive critic and patron of artists. In 1928, Keat held his first exhibition in Colombo and immediately caused a furore among the fashionable academic artists of that time, engaged in what one critic described as futile imitation of the unessential characteristics of the cheapest style of representation in Western art. Critics of Keat, meanwhile, classed him among hysterics and degenerates who injure true art and vitiate good taste. Keat's early paintings show remarkable sophistication. 
an awareness of Picasso, Prague, and Matisse in his attitude to nature, together with a graceful calligraphic line harking back to Sigiria. He also experimented with abstractionism. The biggest sensation, however, was the nude portrait exhibited. The very first nude by a Ceylonese artist to be publicly exhibited in starchy colonial Colombo. The boldest critic timidly commented, the head demands careful study and the skin tones are well rendered. Keats' characteristic genius clearly showed in his early exhibitions and was recognized by the perceptive, such as his friend Pablo Neruda, the Chilean poet. Keats is the living nucleus of a great painter. These figures take on a strange expressive grandeur and radiate an aura of intensely profound feeling. After these early paintings in a broadly naturalistic style, Keat moved forward stylistically into greater reliance on line and rhythm. This enabled him to express more effectively and traditionally the universal Hindu myths common to Sri Lanka and India. Keats' characteristic style and idiom had emerged. Keats' creative vision also expressed itself in his English poetry, expressing a rich emotion unheard in colonial Colombo. Creating a path of anguish across the sky, leading away into the wilderness and the distant plains. Quivering in the haze of a dark noon that will not stir. Is it the cry of the silver oboes on the pillars of the drum beat? The cry of the peacocks on the gates of the temple. Soon after, Keat fulfilled an artistic undertaking that placed him firmly among the great unknown temple painters of Sri Lanka. He painted the Buddha's life on the walls of the Gotami Vihara in Borel. Keat's frescoes were a radical departure from the sad daubings that had vulgarized the serenity of many lovely temples. The Gautami frescoes were painted by Keat as the offering of a devotee for the serene joy and emotion of the pious. They were painted on a heroic scale and were a bold departure from the pallid realism of the period. But they were solidly traditional in their moving treatment of the great themes of the Buddha's life. Themes reinterpreted by every century in its artistic idiom. The birth of Siddhartha, his golden youth as a royal prince. His growing awareness of the cycle of samsara. The great renunciation. The struggle with Mara. Enlightenment and Buddhahood. In 1939, Keat visited South India, which made a tremendous emotional and artistic impact. The magnificent temples of a vital Hinduism, which was the fount of all belief, art, and the way of life. The great temples at Madura, Sri Rangam, and Chidambaram, the incomparable Carnatic music, the dancers of Bharatanatyam and Kathakali all deepened Keats' immersion in the mainstream of Hindu tradition and strengthened the mythic element in his art. Mm -hmm. 
Keith now published his English version of Jayadeva's great Sanskrit love poem, Gita Govinda. The poet's traditional and bold treatment of sexual passion and the pain of separation are strongly recurrent themes in Keith's paintings. Gautami frescoes, Keat renounced the conventional life of the townsman and secluded himself in a Candian village to think, observe, write and paint, absorbing fully the gentle perennial rhythms of peasant life and the deep springs of their beliefs. Keats' emotions were deeply involved in the struggle against imperialism in India and fascism. This struggle he painted in Bhima and Jarasandha. Keats' richest achievements of this period are his lyrical pictures of the beauty of woman, love and fulfillment. The Naika paintings and others which are poems of love and a rich celebration of woman in all her beauty and the fulfillment of his life in the village enriched by reference to the great Indian love poems. Nineteen forty three was a significant year for Keat as well as for art in Ceylon. Lionel Went organized the forty three group of progressive artists, responsible for some of the most vital and significant work of that time. Present at this exhibition was Martin Russell, a young English aristocrat of discernment who was immediately impressed by Keats' work. I was profoundly excited. Although at that time the local significance and the Candian and Indian overtones of Keats' work were largely beyond me. Martin Russell became Keats' close friend patron and publicist. He wrote a book that still remains the most sensitive and comprehensive ever written on Keat and his art. It introduced Keat to a far wider circle of art lovers in India and Europe. In 1945, Keat went again to India and its artistic world took him to its heart. He'd always been impelled to continue the Indian tradition in the idiom of today. Mulk Raj Anand, the famous writer, organized in Bombay a magnificent Keat exhibition which won high praise. More exhibitions followed in Delhi and Madras. Keat became an outstanding figure in the world of modern Indian art. Keat returned to Sri Lanka, triumphantly hailed as its only artistic colossus. International acclaim, official patronage, and popular recognition were showered on him. Major exhibitions of his work were mounted, and his paintings hung in major art galleries in many world capitals. He painted a mural on a heroic scale for the national headquarters of the People's Bank. The University of Sri Lanka honored him with a doctorate. It has been a rich and rewarding journey of discovery for Keat, the poet artist. He has always been both revolutionary and reactionary. Revolutionary in his continuing struggle for artistic expression, 
reactionary in his deep homage to the creative vitality of the great and ancient Hindu and Buddhist traditions, whose truest interpreter he remains today. fossilized old master. He remains as creative and vital an artist as ever. He paints all the time, and Saraswati, the goddess of art, has made him her own. Keat was born at the turn of the century, so the man is as old as our times. But Keat, the artist, is forever young. Thank you. 